Hi, I'm J. Allen Sanford from the San Diego Reader. I'm back to take you through another episode of the 1950s science fiction television anthology, Tales of Tomorrow. Written about shows like this for magazines like Cult Movies, Starlog, and Film Facts. And the Reader published my in-depth history of this program a while back. That article was started back in 1989 when I interviewed several of the show creators and performers. And I'll be quoting from several of those interviews over the course of these DVD commentaries. This second episode of Tales of Tomorrow, Blunder, was broadcast live as it was performed on an ABC Network soundstage on August 10th, 1951 at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. If you're on the West Coast, you had to wait until August 24th to see the Kinescope version. The story begins with someone giving a lecture at a planetary observatory, and he's talking about how the Earth would look from another planet, Venus, as the Earth was blowing up, either from an atomic disaster or from being hit by a comet. Right. Hey, everybody, let's kick things off on a real cheery note. <laughs> so, the planetary lecture is being played by Will Hassong. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, but he did stuff like Naked City in 1958. He did The Defenders in 1961. Uh, he did some early 80s episodes of the Edge of Night soap opera, and you can actually even see him as a doctor in footage from Woody Allen Zelig in 1983. Now, it's notable that producers went with another dumbass scientist causes doomsday scenario right out of the gate here at the second episode. Given the show's frequently dim view of humanity and the, the weekly dire warnings about our inevitable doom that they present for us, Blunder is going to portray one of the many world-endangering mad scientists seen over the course of the show. And Robert Allen is going to play our scientist. He's working at an Arctic lab on a new kind of nuclear reactor that could provide limitless free energy for mankind uh, using what they refer to in the show here. Here we are in the Arctic. Uh, Arctic is suitable for it because it, what they're talking about is bismuth fission, which is a real thing and it really does work best in cold temperatures. Based on actual research at the time into the fission of bismuth, lead, thallium, platinum. Um, and basically they, they would uh, bombard it with high-energy particles. That, that research actually didn't supposedly go on. So it makes sense the experiments would take place in the cold of the Antarctic. That's, uh, I guess, the show's nod to scientific accuracy. So our, our, our scientist here, actor, is Robert Allen, as I mentioned. He was an early Western star of a half-dozen Bob Allen Ranger movies that were produced between 1936 and 1937. And uh, he was almost as popular as his horse in those, his horse named Pal. He appeared in more than 40 movies and on several TV shows. And he switched his career actually later, in a, later on to focus on Broadway and off-Broadway productions. He appeared in theatricals like Showboat, Kiss Them For Me. Uh, he also played the nasty Mr. Babcock in Auntie May. Robert Allen already had some experience in uh, creepy and far-out TV anthologies before he did this show. The previous year, in 1950, he was in an episode of Suspense called Dark Shadows, and that was about a blind man who can sense the whereabouts of supposedly a supposedly dead criminal who blinded him. And in the same year this aired, 1951, Robert Allen also starred an episode of The Web, a really interesting anthology. That episode was called The Great Diamond Discovery, as well as appearing on an episode of Out There in 1951, another uh, somewhat supernatural uh, anthology, and that, ep that episode was called Outer Limit. I guess that's kind of weird titling, 1950 and 1951 shows called Dark Shadows and Outer Limit. But uh, his final role was in the 1986 film Raiders of the Living Dead, uh, a real cheapy starring Scotty Schwartz, who went from being a kid actor in Richard Pryor's The Toy in 1982, and he was in A Christmas Story in 1983, he went from that to being a porn star in films like Scotty's X-Rated Adventure. I guess the less said about that, the better. Uh, the scientist's daughter here is played by Anne Loring. She later became an author and a writing teacher, and she, uh, she in fact, wrote an episode of Lux Video Theater, Theater the following year, in 1952. Sort of an early pioneering female writer in the field. Uh, she wrote an episode of that show called The Sound of Waves Breaking for Lux Video Theater. Her relatively short career in front of the camera included a couple of 1930s films, yeah, she did Robin Hood of El Dorado, another one called Absolute Quiet. And she was in a couple of 1954 episodes of the TV series Rocky King Detective. 
She pretty much finished off her acting career with a regular role in the mid-1960s TV series Love of Life, playing a character named Tammy Forrest. Anne Loring was later a drama teacher and an author who spent several years serving as president of the New York local of AFTRA, and she was also governor and trustee of the National Academy of TV Arts and Sciences for a while. She also spent over 20 years search, teaching courses uh, in writing at the New School of Social Research. So getting back to our story here, the scientist played by Robert Allen, he's actually unaware that uh, he made a mistake in his calculations. Uh, he, he knows that there's a risk, but he decides to proceed with this test he wants to do, a test experiment, where he's going to start up this new nuclear reactor over an untested deposit of an atomic element that, that may or may not be stable. It's, it's completely untested. And uh, at, like most scientists we see in Tales of Tomorrow, we see he's completely willing to risk setting off what in this case so it might be a chain reaction that could destroy the entire world's oxygen supply. Uh, maybe even set the atmosphere on fire and initiate doomsday just because he's obsessed with uh, completing this experiment. Now someone's trying to call him here on the radio um, because they've uh, other scientists have deduced that his uh, his calculations are almost certainly in error. But he's not willing to listen to them. He's, he's perfectly willing to take the chance that any flip of the coin is going to land whatever side he thinks should be the winner. And uh, he estimates there's a, only a 1 in 100 chance he'll set the planet on fire. But the colleagues who keep trying to reach him over the radio here have found an error in his calculations. And they estimate the experiment will almost certainly end life as we know it on Earth. So this headlong rush to complete the experiment, despite the risk causes uh, his fellow scientists to actually, they, they conscript the President of the United States. And they're trying to call him on the phone, on the radio, but the scientist here, he really just wants to be a big blundering dick. He doesn't want to acknowledge that there's a, a possibility of an error in his calculations. Um, and he's not, he doesn't even want to let his wife hear into the phone. He won't listen to her warnings either, uh, even though she makes it clear that, and you can tell by the look on her face here, she desperately wants uh, him to consider that this is a possibility. And uh, she, she would love to answer the phone before 9 p.m. rolls around. That's kind of odd because 9 p.m. is when he has to do this experiment. It's never really explained why the, um, the deposit's not going anywhere. He's not going anywhere, but for some reason they've got this countdown. And uh, the, the anti-nuclear subtext of this, of course, is very clear in the way the scientist is willing to risk setting off this atmospheric chain reaction without even studying what could happen as a result. And we need to keep in mind here that the nuclear bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that was only in August 1945, which was only six years previous to this episode airing on TV. And, and of course, before those bombs went off, nobody knew what might happen when they detonated the first atomic bombs either. They, there were people then who thought the Earth's atmosphere could catch fire. That's not that far different from, uh, from our blundering scientists here, uh, who's, who's willing to possibly deplete the world's oxygen supply. There's also a very Rod Serling-esque anti-censorship slant uh, that gets mentioned by a character in the dialogue who says uh, he thinks nuclear secrets shouldn't be secret after all. Open communication is the only way for mankind to be, and all knowledge is to be shared. And he laments any attempt to censor information, even about atomic experiments, since the work could just as easily benefit mankind as, as cause its ruin. So... A couple of the scientists at this point have decided that they're going to have to hop on a plane and, and fly to Antarctica and uh, warn the scientists before 9 o'clock rolls around. And, uh, you know, clearly that's just sort of a dramatic device, the 9 p.m. The original story that we were working from was by an author named Philip Wiley. Uh, it's a story that he wrote and was published in Collier's Magazine in the January 12, 1946 issue. The story's original full title was Blunder, a story of the end of the world. That sort of gives away the ending, doesn't it? <clears throat> the original story set in the 1970s after the so-called short war between Russia and the USA, which is essentially World War III. It's uh, left the country, the USA, ravaged, uh, basically ravaged wasteland and in search of a power source that can revitalize technology. That story has a, two blundering scientists and they decide to explode an atomically powered bomb that was created with this bismuth radiation formula that uh, our episode here refers to. They want to set that off in an abandoned Scandinavian mine in the original story. Before the bomb can go off, the other scientists review the duo's calculations. They'd been published in like a scientific journal. 
And they realized, much like the scientists in our TV show, the explosions could finish off the planet for good. And in that case, this, it's security restrictions that prevent anyone from getting to the bomb site before the explosions, uh, omega ray, I believe it's, it's what they refer to it as, before those explosions can destroy the Earth. And that's why they can't <clears throat> get there in the original story. Here, blunder appears to refer to the, the, the scientists as much as it does the incident because it's the, it's the willful ignorance of the scientists themselves. Uh, that is causing him to not pay heed to all of his fellow scientists and the president and uh, the radio and on the phone. I mean, he's obviously willing to just go ahead and do it anyways. Uh, Philip Wiley wrote stories like that fairly often about the uh, rushing headlong into nuclear proliferation. Uh, in fact, he, he, he was so noted for having done that that at one point the government put him under, a, put him under house arrest in the 1940s. They had to investigate him and try to understand how it was that his stories seemed to know so much and, and potentially reveal uh, so much about atomic energy. There was a concern there that he might have access to or might even inadvertently uh, reveal national secrets about atomic energy. So Philip Wiley was one of, uh, also one of the original 12 writers whose body of work formed basis for this program. There was uh, authors, 12 authors that had agreed to pool their work together for something they called the Science Fiction League of America. Uh, this coalition was formed really by the show producers, gathering up these 12 authors whose stories all together numbered around uh, 3,000 potential Tales of Tomorrow adaptations. However, this was actually uh, Philip Wiley's only story adapted for the program. We're not really sure why that is. Wiley was the author of around three dozen novels. He wrote over a dozen nonfiction books, did at least 50 scripts, and over a dozen serials. His novel, When Worlds Collide, was made into a film the same year as this episode, 1951. Uh, his 1930 novel, Gladiator, about how an individual with godlike powers would fit into a modern society, is widely considered to be one of the inspirations for the Superman characters, co-created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. The title character of that one, of Gladiator, is a genetically, uh, genetically created by his mad scientist father. And he says things uh, in the context of the book like, quote, I can jump higher in a house. I can run faster in a train. I'm like a man made out of iron, unquote, which really does sound Superman-esque. Gladiator was made into a 1938 movie. In fact, if you read Alan Moore's Watchmen comic book, you can spot a copy of the Gladiator book in Hollis Mason's home, which makes sense, I guess, since Watchmen also was about super-powered individuals uh, making their way in the real world. Aside from having his stories adapted for film and television, Philip Wiley tried his hand fairly successfully at writing uh, a few of his own screenplays. He's the co-writer of the classic 1932 version of H.G. Wells' Island of Lost Souls, and he was also involved in creating the characters for a 1955-1956 TV series called Crunch and Des, which he also occasionally wrote scripts for. And that show starred future F Troop star Forrest Tucker as a sports fisherman. It's about uh, the ins and outs and the adventures of running his own marina operation. Oh, and Philip Wiley's brother, Max Wiley, he co-created, uh, he created the late 60s, uh, early 70s Sally Field TV series, The Flying Nun. Our story here was adapted by a writer named Charles O'Neill, and he also helped adapt Robert Sheckley's story, The Monsters, for another 1951 Tales of Tomorrow episode. Uh, that was a story adaptation. The Monsters was also uh, produced as a 1959 episode of the TV anthology, The Unforeseen. And that version, the 59 version, starred John Vernon, who played Dean Wormer in Animal House. Uh, Charles O'Neill also adapted a Julian C. May story for Tales of Tomorrow in 1952, a story called The Dune Roller. And uh, that same story was the basis of a 1972 film called The Cremators. That's how great these stories were. They got used a lot. They turned up in films all the way into the 70s and 80s and beyond. Uh, he was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, Charles O'Neill. He got his start on television uh, on one of the top-rated and most respected anthologies of the era. Uh, or ever, really, Studio One, one of his very first gigs. In October 1940, uh, Studio One aired an episode called Good for 30 Days that O'Neill adapted from a story that was actually originally co-created by the original co-producer of Boris Karloff's thriller, a fellow named Fletcher Markle. 
And uh, he was the producer known for doing mainly the non-horror episodes of that uh, thriller series. Uh, Charles O'Neill also wrote for a series that was uh, called Martin Kane, Private Eye, in 1954. He co-wrote the screenplay for the 1957 film Johnny Trouble. Our director for this episode, someone we talked about in at least one other commentary, his name is Leonard Valenza, and uh, he also directed the very first episode of the series, Verdict from Space, uh, and then he pretty well bows out of the show after that. Uh, he was, Valenza was just getting started at that time in a career that would find him doing uh, other TV anthologies like The Mask in 1954, he did Windows in 1955, did one called The Big Story, he directed 19, uh, nearly 300 episodes of a 1953-1954 daily daytime TV sitcom called Marge and Jeff. That was pretty unusual, a syndicated daytime sitcom that ran five days a week. And it was about newlyweds in Manhattan that ran for nearly two years. You can thank Leonard Valenta for that interesting television experiment. Although best known as a director, Leonard Valenta got his start as an occasional actor. He was a regular on America's very first commercially broadcast TV soap opera back in 1942, a show called The Last Nest. That was a daytime show produced by WPTZ Channel 3 in Philadelphia. And they first began broadcasting shows on TV the previous year, 1941. But The Last Nest aired over NBC TV also at the time, which uh, an early, basically an early experiment in syndication. They only had a handful of affiliates. And uh, the show is widely believed to be the first TV program to have a recurring storyline. Uh, at the time, Leonard Valenta was a freshman at Temple University, trying his hand at acting, and he returned to his soap opera roots later in his career. But he was a director at that time. He directed around a dozen episodes of the TV soap The Guiding Light. And he, wrote, uh, he directed others like the As the World Turns, The Edge of Night, uh, another one called Loving. And... Uh, Leonard Valenta also worked again with the producer of this program, someone uh, we've talked about in other commentaries and we may talk a bit more about here, a fellow named Mort Abrams. Uh, they worked together uh, apart from this series two years later after this ended in 1955. Uh, Mort Abrahams decided to return to televised science fiction then. He hired Leonard Valenta to work with him. I'll read you actually a quote from Mort Abrams in the late 80s interview that I did and I'll tell you a little bit about that show. He says, quote, Windows was my program. This was a summer show we did to replace some show that had been canceled or whatever. I think I did 12 episodes of that, and the best one was a story by Ray Bradbury, the dwarf, unquote. And you may be familiar with that story. That's the short story about the little person uh, who looks into an enchanted funhouse mirror at a carnival and, uh, and imagines himself tall. Uh, that was a... An episode, a story that was later adapted for an episode of the Ray Bradbury Presents TV series. Uh, an episode that uh, starred Megan Follows, who is, I believe she was the one who played Anne of Green Gables uh, in the television series. We have, we have a relatively large cast here. Um, I think there's nine uh, people credited all together. No, actually, uh, there might be upwards of a dozen or so credited in the, in the credits at the end. Um, they're, so, they're on the plane here right now getting ready to parachute out over the research site. So I'll tell you about a couple of the actors here that we're going to see now. The actor with the glasses on the right is Philip Faversham. And he did uh, other, he's the guy with the glasses. He did other anthologies like The Clock, Philco Television Theater Playhouse, uh, Craft Theater, he did one of the latter-day anthologies in the 1960s, The United States Steel Hour. His final roles in the 1969 sex farce, The Minx, which is really best known for featuring the folk rock band The Circle and their song Squeeze Play. Not really much of a movie. If you haven't, uh, if you're not caught that, you really haven't missed much. Um, the other fellow here, the scientist on the left, without the glasses, he's played by Alan Drake. He's best remembered for the role on the, uh, as Rodney Victor on the TV comedy uh, Sanford and Son. He began his career as a stand-up comic in the 50s, appearing on the Ed Sullivan Show and later the Jackie Gleason Show. Uh, he was on the Dean Martin Comedy Hour. In the 70s, he opened for everyone from Tom Jones to Engelbert Humperdinck to Tony Martin and Vic Damone. His TV show appearances as an actor include Cheyenne, The Good Guys, Get Smart, 
the courtship of Eddie's father, and too close for comfort. Uh, I mentioned uh, producer Mort Abrams earlier. He, he headed up the show. He got his start in TV producing Tom Corbett's Space Cadet in 1950. And the Abrahams would later go on to work on shows like Route 66, The Man from Uncle. Uh, he did the first two Planet of the Apes films and other movies like Dr. Doolittle and Goodbye Mr. Chips. Uh, when I interviewed Mort Abrahams in the late 80s, he talked about the show's legacy. And I'll read you one of his quotes. He said, quote, I think in a sense, later shows like Twilight Zone and Outer Limits were an outgrowth of Tales of Tomorrow. But the technology changed. Those shows were on film. The setting, the direction, the camera work on Tales of Tomorrow now looks, and indeed is, very old-fashioned and much less sophisticated. They were naive and represented the technology and techniques of those days. But those days were replaced by more sophisticated systems of delivery, equipment, and even different schools of acting and directing and camera work. Unquote. Abrahams also mentioned how Tales of Tomorrow's micro-budget made things challenging. I'll read you one more quote of his. He said, quote, General Electric Theater was a different, different kettle of fish. It was a big budget with Ronnie Reagan as the host. It represented a big move for me in terms of having money to spend. My entire staff on Tales of Tomorrow was Jim Lister part-time, a secretary half a day, and myself. So I had a cot in my office because I frequently spent three or four nights a week sleeping in the office. I had to turn out copies of the script with a hand-cranked mimeograph machine, and I didn't have any money to deliver them to the actors by messenger or by cab. They had to be delivered by whoever was available to me, by bus and subway. It was really skinny money time, unquote. And uh, it does kind of show on screen sometimes. Um, the soundtracks were one of the ways that uh, he was able to save money. Most of the episodes were cobbled together using uh, music from the network library. Although, according to Abrahams, the guy who selected the music and spun the records uh, for quite a while was Jerry Goldsmith, who later became a very famous composer. He was then 21 years old, but he'd go on to work for CBS and then uh, become famed for scoring genre features like uh, Planet of the Apes, Logan's Run, Alien, Total Recall, Gremlins, The Omen, Lost World, Jurassic Park, and, and several films in the Star Trek franchise. Uh, most Tales of Our episodes, though, are scored with kind of crazy, over-the-top organ music, um, really geared towards radio shows and, and of, that, uh, of that ilk. And, kind of overpowering of the story sometimes. In this episode, there's an interesting twist in the soundtrack. If you listen closely, uh, there's a song that was never mentioned in the credits. Uh, there's a recognizable tune that ABC apparently had the rights for. Uh, it's called September Song by German theatrical composer Kurt Weill. Frank Sinatra, Sinatra had a top uh, 10 hit with that in 1946. September Song is, is based on a metaphor comparing a year to a person's life uh, from birth to death. Kind of interesting choice. Among the lyrics are, uh, we'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day, which uh, is unusually optimistic sounding considering how most of these Tales of Tomorrow episodes <laughs> end. Uh, we're getting pretty close to the ending here, although pretty much the only happy endings in Tales of Tomorrow are the commercials where at least a pretty housewife gets a nice sparkly Chrysler watch band to show off while some dimwit scientist uh, melts the earth into a tar pit. That, that juxtaposition of the gloomy pessimistic storylines into these cheery commercials intended to sell you jewelry was often jarring and, and even pretty funny. You have to kind of admire companies like Chrysler Jewelry and Maslan Carpets, who are another uh, sponsor of the show for being willing to back adult science fiction on television, even though the stories they were sponsoring indicated that things like jewelry and carpeting probably weren't going to do mankind a whole lot of good. Uh, but it is notable that advertisers like Chrysler and, and Maslin were clearly ignoring the kids' market and the kids who watch shows like Captain Video, uh, Rod Brown of the Rocket Rangers, and they were instead targeting the adult audience, um, as, as did... Uh, they did some public service announcements, things like that, U.S. defense bonds. And, well, it's 9 o'clock, we see, is rolled around. The scientist wants to uh, push this big, giant, <laughs> sort of ridiculous-looking lever here in the foreground and uh, do his experiment. He didn't take any of the calls, and uh, unfortunately, whoops. Once again, just like in episode one, I'm coming, along with the footage of an atomic bomb this time, the world's been blown up 
for the second time in two weeks. That's, uh, that's Tales of Tomorrow for you. We even get to see our entire large cast of nearly a dozen people blowing up in different places all over the world. And uh, isn't that a cheery TV show for us? Um, he, there's going to be a commercial after this again trying to sell you a few things. <laughs> uh, trying to sell you. I believe in this episode the commercials were uh, public service announcements. In the beginning it was one for care packages. Uh, in the end, I think it was savings bonds. And the, the episode here ends with a guy at the observatory, and he's, he's calmly telling us, our scientists know exactly what they're doing. There isn't a possible chance of a blunder. Uh, I'll tell that to the Tales of Tomorrow writers. So that about wraps it up for another episode of Tales of Tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed watching uh, Blunder with me as much as I've enjoyed doing the commentary track. Thanks for watching and listening. You can hear some of these interviews that I've been mentioning uh, with the show creators on other commentary tracks by toggling back and forth between the commentaries and the actual full sound. There's uh, three or four commentaries for some tracks, I mean for some episodes. For uh, the Frankenstein episode, you have two creator commentaries uh, and three other commentaries by authors and uh, screenwriters besides. And, uh, and these transfers are some of the best that uh, have ever been done from the original kinescopes. Uh, kinescopes being just basically they used to point a camera at a TV set as they aired the program while it was performed live. And by virtue of that, we can see and enjoy these and talk about them today. So thanks for joining us. We have plenty more on this disc, and I uh, hope you get to play those shortly. And hope you've enjoyed watching the episode with us. And, uh, and thank you, Leonard Vaughn.